Hey everybody, how's it going? It is 1-26-2018. How's everybody doing today? All right. Today is my birthday, and uh, while I'm doing that, I'm gonna debut a new story that uh, I never read before, and uh, a lot of history behind it. Uh, let's just start it out with a poem that came from that same period of time. 2014. The poem to begin this morning's uh, celebrations is Morning at the Mental Hospital. It was published in September 2014 edition of Verse Virtual.com. Special thanks to Mr. Firestone Fire, uh, Feinberg for publishing me, and then uh, he published me again in January of this year, and he published my individual World Poetry Slam After Party uh, poem, which was awesome, that I wrote at the, uh, the Bartlett. Okay, this is called Morning in a Mental Hospital. Good morning, spherical ball of almost eternal flame. Peeking over the trees in the horizon, your red glow burns itself into my retinas and follows me round this page, fluttering and bobbing and dodging my attempts to catch you with my hands. Oh, morning sun, lead me to a better day, perhaps a better one than yesterday. It is seven o'clock in the morning, yes it is, and normally I wouldn't be writing this early, but I am still here, and it is either this or watch saccharine music videos on the day room TV. Oh, morning sun, lead me to a better way of life. Some maniac just hauled off and assaulted the German woman next to me. I had to get security, but she just wouldn't stop this flying at flesh in a blind, whirling fury. So sudden and intense it all seemed unreal. Good morning to you, too. Yeah, I was sitting there watching music videos and I watched uh, uh, an altercation, let's call it that, yeah. And uh, a lot of moments um, from these places, these hospitals and things over the years. Uh, well, I've, I've been keeping my eyes open and, uh, and absorbing everything and uh, kind of like condensed it down into my little stories and things. And here is a pretty big story. This is called Medication Time. During the early morning hours of February 2nd, 2032, a call is placed to 912. Emergency services were summoned to deal with a psychiatric crisis regarding a suicidal individual named Ricky. Ricky was a person who felt like he could not deal with existence anymore and urgently needed assistance. And he did all of this too with full knowledge of exactly where he would end up without insurance. The notorious Cumberland County, New Jersey, Cy Sock Haas. The, e e the EMT tried his best to talk down Ricky. He reassured him that where they were headed was indeed safe, saying, They'll find a bed for you. Don't worry too much about that. It might take a while, but they'll get you set up. Ricky did not draw much consolation from those words. After all, here he was, strapped down to an aluminum hospital gurney, fumbling with his phone while his wrists were bound, with well-worn and filthy leathers ridden with bite marks. Just let me know if you maybe need them straps loosened, said the EMT. It was at that moment that a green sedan cut off the patient transport. The driver veered out of the way and caromed off the guard rail. Boom! Brains rattling around in his head, Ricky was overcome by a pang of motion sickness. 
and as such he puked all over himself. It was going to be a long day to be certain. When he got there, they stripped him down, blasted him with a fire hose, and was thereupon scrubbed by white shirt, hazmat, sanitation, and control engineers. They x-rayed his body in case he had a concealed weapon, or even worse, a few condoms packed full of heroin, fentanyl bindles, and cocaine packed in his, shall we say, more intimate areas. Then they put him through a psychological screening, compliments of the automated Doc X 12,000 psychiatric physician system. Ricky was subjected to a barrage of aggressive questioning, questions that often repeated again and again. Blah, 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 thought Ricky. The monotony was already setting in. Today's group is going to be on self-esteem, said the bubbly and possibly bipolar herself therapist, Griselda. Self-esteem is basically how you look at yourself. Her narrow eyes lined with bluish smudges of makeup crudely drawn on looked out upon her audience. And what a lively bunch it was, too. Eight depressed people, morose and apathetic, acute and chronic. As for a who's who of the patients involved, there was Milky Joe, the wild sociopath, Aloysius, the masturbating elderly cyborg, Desmond, the self-harming compulsive eater with Pika. Oh, Greta, the atypical schizophrenic, Chester, the cheese dog, a bipolar bastard if there ever was one with borderline personality disorder and also a cyborg. And Eunice, the wayward blonde with perpetually running mascara, violent mood swings, and a suicide complex. These were the patients of Unit E, Floor 5. They were all very colorful, and they were all very restless. While the therapist went on about care plans, Aloysius kicked his feet and blew a spit bubble of disconcerting size. The door on the southeast corner of the room opened. Who was there? It was Ricky. He arrived and was followed closely behind by the head, white shirt, sterile and starched, perpetually angry, with arms covered in horned, flame-belching Japanese demons and tribal tattoos. His name was Masterson, the white shirt king. And he was hated by everybody who came into contact with him Doubly so by the patients. They called him the King Nazi. Chester the Cheese Dog drew his lips back into a bristly grin, saying, Hey, looks like some new meat on the grill. <laughs> Mimicking the sizzling and popping of grease, the skin of Ricky's face tightened, contorting involuntarily with the horrible thoughts of what the knights here were going to be like. Ricky waved weakly to his new compatriots. Milky Joe crumbled up a ball of notebook paper and threw it at Ricky, exclaiming, Go home! The patients laughed at Ricky. The bubbly therapist glared at Milky, stating, Oh, Milky Joe, come on! Now, will you please respect the others? Will you dare to be great? Thanks! A fly buzzed through the air past Griselda's left ear. She reached up to swat it and missed. The position of the clouds outside shifted and let light in through the dusty horizontal blinds. The long days were passing, shifting into one another. Time got away from you here in many ways, such as this. A so stay here was a lot like jail. And for the truly unlucky, it was 
a lot like prison. But we'll get to that. One cannot hide the truth forever, especially those ones most uncomfortable to speak of in these tales. Aloysius loudly snorted <laughs> with contempt and disdain. He was the licentious old curmudgeon, low-functioning, but highly horny. They oftentimes taped up his hands so he couldn't whack his willy all day. And guess what? Today, his hands weren't taped up. Okay. I will leave it to you to determine where his hands were and what they were doing. Thanks. Sure, no problem. We've got a new client in today, announced Griselda. Do you want to introduce yourself to everybody? She suggested it to Ricky before lightly grabbing him by his left arm. She pulled him down towards a vacant seat that held a not-so-faint veneer of filth upon it. The white shirt Nazi king, Master Sun, closed the door shut, slamming it hmm, loudly behind him. The abrupt snap of the lock caused Ricky to jump out of his newly acquired hot seat with surprise. It's okay! It's okay! Griselda urged, staring down at a clipboard loaded to capacity with papers. A camera on the wall zoomed in on them from its position high up in a cobweb-laden corner. Hi, um, I'm Ricky. He sheepishly spouted, not looking anyone directly in the eye. Hello, Ricky, said mostly everyone. Rick took the to Desmond, who was chewing on his fingernails with a special zeal and tenacity. Rick stared stupidly for a moment before eyeing up the beautiful Eunice. Her eyes met Rick's and lit up like hazel green diamonds adorned with long lashes and ornamented with a look of distant yet great sadness within them. Wow, thought Rick, his heart beating just a little bit faster. So, uh, what's your steam feel like today, Rick? Asked Griselda. Rick paused for a few long moments, pondering what his answer would be. Then he said, Self-esteem, it doesn't feel like, doesn't feel like anything. Like, there's nothing there. And, you know, I feel like shit, to be quite honest. Hmm, oh, and, uh, by the way, while you're here, could you please watch your language? What? Aren't you people equipped to deal with that or something? I mean, they're just words. Griselda eyed Rick as a cat eyes its avian prey. That's right, Rick. And some patients here are extremely sensitive to that sort of language. Milky spoke up. Oh, go fuck yourself, you windbag. I've shoveled shit up my ass. More interesting than you are with your blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. I'm here voluntarily. That's how he pronounced it. And I'll check myself out of here anytime I want. Like that. Boom. <laughs> he announced dryly, snapping his fingers. Don't get me started on you again, Joe. You're, qu you're quite the opposite of voluntarily. It's been a whole week. A week is a long period when you're sitting on your ass doing not a goddamn thing the whole time except watching reruns of reality show dog shit. Language! Milky rose from his seat quite suddenly. <sighs> With arms outstretched, fists clenched into balls of raging tension. He kicked his chair over on its side. This right here is one big fucking waste of time. Eunice nudged away in her squeaky chair. Aloysius nodded way back, his head tilting, while his left hand reflexively gripped and released his man meat in tandem. Yeah. Morning, morning bowl. How's everybody doing? That's how we do it. That's how we do it out here in Washington State. <coughs> 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 
Poetry and weed. <coughs> Poetry and weed. I'm a kill a motherfucker! Milky Joe yelled. I will if you don't let me out of this horrible place. This fucking hole of despair and shame and goddamn anxiety. I can't take it anymore. Ah! Whilst Milky Joe was pontificating to the choir, Rick couldn't help but notice Desmond staring oddly at him. Well, hello, Ricky. How are you doing today? Muttered the man with his fingers jammed in his mouth. I'm Des. Milky felt an innate need to interrupt his one-sided conversation in favor of interrupting Ricky's. Shut up, Des! Nobody in this history of mankind has ever wanted to hear you talk! And not to mention, I ordered food this morning, and my tray wasn't on the fucking cart. I asked, where's my food? Where is my food? And they told me, oh, it doesn't seem to be here. I told Jimmy what I wanted to. I don't get why no one in this goddamn place will fucking listen to me for one second. Because you're an asshole, Ricky thought. Milky Joe took a deep breath before continuing. Is it me? Am I not speaking? Or do you screwball white shirts? Not hear me talking? Look at my lips. Are they moving? Can you fucking see them? Joseph! Yelled Griselda harshly. I said, are my lips moving around? Hello, my name is Milky Joe, and I am talking. One more word, Joseph, and it's the restraints for you. Griselda warned. I am not kidding. Oh, sure, answered Milky Joe. Tie down your problems when you can't solve them. Tie them down and stick them in a soundproof room somewhere at the end of the fucking hall. It doesn't matter. Want to know why? Huh? I will not be silenced so easily. At the exact moment, two white shirts who had crept in seemingly unnoticed descended on top of Milky Joe. <laughs> The pair came from behind in a concerted effort to subdue the client quickly, efficiently, and not too messily. They throttled him by his arms and legs as Joe was in the middle of a wild gesticulation. <laughs> hey, you idiots! screamed Milky as he violently struggled against his aggressors. Get off of me! Tim, I thought we were cool, man! Give this poor guy a break, all right? I'm begging you! The one known as Tim released his hold on Milky in order to draw liquid from a small bottle. It was a bottle with a long, heavy gauge 10cc plastic syringe, a combination muscle relaxant and atypical antipsychotic. Upon intramuscular intra administration, its effects would quickly take hold. And that was exactly the case when Tim gave Milky Joe the shot in the back of his right arm. As the seconds passed, Milky Joe began to slur his words <laughs> while still trying his damnedest to keep the hospital staff at a distance. You can't do this to me! Joe screamed as he was finally cornered and subdued. Milky Joe fell to the ugly, textured carpets, screaming his lamentations. The two white shirts laid all of their weight on top of his back. Joe kicked his feet against the floor with his beige hospital issue socks and tried fruitlessly to pull himself free. Whoa, fight him off, Milky! Chester resounded. Them white shirts is nothing for a guy like you! Shut up or I will shut you up! Tim, the white shirt, yelled, preparing another syringe. He jammed it into Milky's backside. Wahoo! exclaimed Milky, the sharp pangs of pain running rampantly through him. They're trying to slow you up, chuckled Chester. Cheese dog, he had one leg folded over the other, his limbs and extremities twitching with tremors, wrapped with medicinally induced athesia. They got you double down! Oh, it's a double down! Resounded Milky, his words more slippery in his mouth by the second. A double down is a patient colloquialism for a second dose of medication necessary to subdue and sedate an agitated individual. It is meant to be a deterrent. Oh, this place is about to give this poor old woman a heart attack cried Greta, 
Popping up from her chair, she tearily grumbled and stomped over towards the coffee pot in the nook. And she angrily poured a cup, spilling most of it on the countertop and floor. Normal? Ha <laughs> ha, who's normal here? Laughed Eunice. Milky became exceptionally woozy. Swaying back and forth on the balls of his feet, the white shirts took advantage of this opportunity, and they forcibly dragged Joe over to the quiet room. Well, now that that nonsense is over, let's get back to group therapy, shall we? Said Griselda, smiling. <laughs> Grazia downed her cup and poured another coffee. With tremulous hands, she passed to survey the group participants and sat back down, muttering quietly. To herself, involuntarily licking her lips over her coarse strawberry blonde mustache like this. All the fucking time. With Milky gone, the group was able to continue on uninterrupted. After the bit on self-esteem... Griselda came back in and did her emotional regulation bit. By dinner time, over half of the room was either passed out or nodding in their seats. And dinner, it was as delicious as you'd expect it to be. Tube steak with grain substitutes smothered in a tasteless and gelatinous brown gravy. The day room doubled as the place where upon the client's meals were held. As a result, little bits of fallen food were everywhere. Rick stared dejectedly at his meal. With both eyes unfocused and glassy, he looked over at Aloysius, the hollowed-out, meat-beating shell of a man. Aloysius was less a man than a composite amalgamation of cheap spare parts made by the Lemon Computer Company. It was the biggest distributor of electronics in the free world. Their products, they worked great for a year or two, and then poof! As a result, we have folks like our fine friend Aloysius who blew an insurance settlement on new parts when they first came out in 2022. And he had no money left when his warranties expired. You do not want brain augmentations going haywire. Grimacing, Rick took a, in a fork full of tube steak and chewed it, thenceforth experiencing its immense dryness on a worldly scale that he would soon rather forget. Yeah, all right. <sighs> Grabbing his tray, Desmond went around the other tables and sat across from Ricky. You doing all right? Desmond asked. Oh, I'm all right. I guess, spoke Ricky. My anxiety level is through the roof, though. <laughs> no kidding. This place fun enough for you? Not really what I imagined it was going to be. I was picturing something calm and relaxing. Oh, well, it, it's not about to get any better. I wasn't asking if it was going to. Oh, yeah, well... I just kind of assumed that you would. Quiet down in there! Yelled Masterson the Nazi from his control booth. He beat on the plexiglass window with his meaty fist. Boom, boom. Oh, why don't you go bother Chester and Milky Joe, you goddamn Nazi? Desmond exclaimed, turning back to Ricky. This place, right? I mean, come on. Yeah, I know, so uh, I have to ask because I always do. What brings you to this princely palace of societal exile and discontent? Oh, you know, depression, anxiety, the usual. Oh, the, uh, the tension surrounding your everyday life built up and up until one day you awoke from your sleep and put a noose around your neck. A bottle of pills in the other. And I said, I said, I'm sorry, God, I cannot do this anymore. 
Well, you're pretty much right there. But you didn't have the balls to go to it. So you cried, that is. Until you got on the phone or online and told somebody. And they got all worried and shit, right? Then they made the conscious decision to head over and see the judge who handed your freedom over to the administration. More or less. And you know what? That's exactly what happened to me as well. Eh, well, I called 912 on myself, said Ricky. I told the cops when they finally showed up that I was going to light myself on fire with a can of gasoline. And we ended up fighting over the box of matches. Oh, it was a mess. I know. Desmond laughed and reached across the table. He gave Ricky a couple pats on the shoulder and picked up his tray. Ricky's attention turned to the TV, covered in spit balls, mounted over by the couches. He got up, dumped his tray, and shuffled over to one of those small, nasty couches located on the other half of the day room in between some one-person overstuffed chairs that had holes picked through them. Rick sat as far away as he could from Chester T's dog, who seemed like he hadn't bathed in many days. Girl, I could tell from the moment I got a look at you, said Chester to Ricky without looking at him. You're an erotic mess of shit. Chester continued, you walk like you got no balls. And you're, you better not make me mad, son. Threatened Chester, he pulled up one of his sleeves of his gown to show off his guns. Yeah, me. The cheese dog spindly left by Sep was ensconced in shiny chrome. I just got her installed last year. Couldn't afford to get the forearm and hand done. Otherwise, I could punch a hole straight through a fucking reinforced concrete wall. <laughs> Ricky let his gaze fall from Chester and let it float back up to the TV. Chester turned his head the other way, grumbling about how life had shortchanged him and his peers. That was when Eunice and Greta came over. How oh, anything good on the TV? Asked Eunice. Well, nothing as good as looking at you, baby cakes. Answered Chester. Eunice came up behind Chester and with a flurry of an open palm, whacked him hard on the crown of his head. I told you this morning to knock it off, Chester. Oh, why don't you leave the poor girl be? Spoke up Greta, adjusting her glasses with her massive aquamarine frames held together with a combination of atomic glue and ultra tape, not quite as ultimate as its name purported. Ah, oh, grumbled Chester. Give me a chance, uni. You won't forget it, and if you do, it's your own fault. He leaned over his seat closer to her. Screamed Eunice, she sat down and away from the cheese dog facing Ricky. Greta sat down next to Rick so she didn't have to turn her head when she talked. Rick instantly recognized her odiferous funk of dermatological creams mixed with piss. Ricky quickly adapted to not breathing through his nose. No, oh, you look like a nice young man, said Greta to Ricky. Don't pay attention to Chester. He's all, all he's interested in is in dope and chasing after skirts. He said some really filthy, degrading things to Eunice a couple of days ago. That's right. That's right, said Eunice. I had to put the freak on contract. That son of a bitch. She looked over suspiciously at Chester. Get your goddamn facts checked, old woman. He growled, folding his arms. He stuck his utterly unimpressive chest out. <laughs> like he imagined himself as an alpha male primate. Got that right? The primate part, anyway. You keep... You kept coming on to me over and over, Eunice objected. The hell I was. It's a two-way fucking street, you know. The other patients looked at each other, except for Aloysius, who remained comatose in his chair in the back, staring at the ceiling, clumsily masturbating. Yeah, okay, Eunice said. Well, stay away from me. Don't talk to me. Don't even look at me. 
Chester scratched his head anxiously and grinned. <laughs> he casually got up and paced around in a circle, gaining speed. While a rant began in the back of his throat and built up in intensity until he was screaming and cursing in a whirlwind. Chester beat his chest. Whoa! Some of the more aware patients scrambled to get away, knowing the potential for what was to happen. Chester scratched his head anxiously and grinned again. <laughs> he casually got up and... Okay, fine. Some of the more aware patients scrambled to get away knowing the potential for what was to happen. Chester, he reeled back to the strike units with a closed chrome fist. And in that moment, Ricky, he abruptly arose. However hesitant to intervene, bring a, ring, a shrill bell tore through the air, ding, 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 whilst the floor itself shook. Ah, oh, it's the fire alarm, exclaimed Eunice. What? Men and men first! Hollered Chester. It's everyone for themselves! Added Rick. Panic ensued. There was a terrific conflagration in the first floor kitchen. The gases from all the tube steaks had built up in the walk-in. And when one of the dishwashers went in there to take a few hits of crystal meth, Mixed with basalts, the whole thing had exploded. It did not help that the reassuring voices on the intercoms missed their mark. Fire alert, fire alert, do not worry, patients of Cumberland Psychiatric. Keep calm and remember to breathe. Please gather in a single file line outside in the hallways and move towards the north stairwell. A baker's dozen of white shirts trampled into the day room, barking orders like it was nobody's business. Not that anyone listened to them. That was until they started busting heads. Aloysius, he got it the worst, which was odd because he was unable to move much. And he couldn't walk, so exactly what was he going to do compared to a guy like Chester Cheese Dog? We're all gonna die! Shut up, Chester, barked Masterson, rushing the patients along as quickly as possible while still maintaining a dim semblance of order. Everyone, get into a single file line. Come on, let's go. Fuck you, Nazi king, shouted Chester. Tim got a grip on Aloysius' wheelchair and spun him 180 degrees. Aloysius was headed towards the fire. Was he secretly suicidal? Probably. The exit to the hallway became quite crowded. It didn't help that Chester was throwing blood-stained elbows everywhere. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and people like Desmond and Greta and Eunice and Ricky and with a guy, a cyborg, like Chester Cheese Dog, 50% of his elbows were deadly metallic weapons. Chaos and blood, spit, and semen flew through the air and onto the ground as different wings of the hospital converged in the hallway. Normally, they were all kept separate from one another in groups of eight to 12 patients at a time. Now it was fire time. Everybody in the hospital got a chance to meet. Not that the patients themselves were all that excited about it. They were excited more so about the impending death downstairs. Masterson came out on his high horse with an extendable 15-foot-long in total cattle prod and a repeating tranquilizer pistol loaded with a drum clip, oversized Thorazine plus lorazepam darts. Commanding the crowd as would a general shouting, Everybody into the stairwell! Anyone who does not comply will be electrified and chemically restrained. If any of you schlubs want to test me, I got plenty of ammo for you. 
I can tell you where to stick that gun, Nazi, said Chester from the back. Of course, he said this whilst using a chronic as a human shield to block the projectile darts. The patients could now smell the flames. Ah. The inferno was near and ever closer. It was climbing floors. It was up to the second tier now, three floors to go before reaching E. Someone go grab the doc. He's doing his rounds, commanded Masterson. What about Milky Joe, said Ricky above the clamor of the calamitous panic mass. Milky who, Chester guffawed. Ah, oh, he's in the quiet room. Added Greta, now with a little help from Eunice, she was crowd surfing over their heads. It's getting awfully smoky in here, Desmond com commented. Ricky thought it was odd that once inside the wide stairwell that the white shirts locked them inside and left them there presumably to go get the Doc X 12,000 and hopefully Milky Joe as well. Why'd they lock us in here? Asked Ricky, his head darted around left and right. Looking by on, beyond the courtyard, beyond the shatterproof glass with the lonesome crack running skewed up the middle to the tree line. To the vague concept of freedom. Smoke came up through the floor, through the fence. It dawned on Ricky the degree of irony that was in play here. Why, not too long ago, it was he who was the one threatening to play with fire, threatening to play with the gas can, to commit suicide in perhaps one of the worst ways that one can. Suicide dreams, everything in between. It all seemed like it had meant something whilst in the darkness. Now, thanks to a lot of therapy and a load of the right meds, Ricky realized that no, he did not want to burn to death to become a horrendous shriveled remnant of a man more of an overcooked campfire s'more than anything else. No! shrieked Ricky panicking. I can't die like this! Like any of us want to, commented Desmond before beginning to correct himself saying, Oh, right. Ricky, weren't you saying that you wanted to set yourself on fire with the... Oh, we're all gonna die in here, interrupted Eunice, screaming bug-eyed and wild. At po this point, she was tearing out handfuls of hair <laughs> and tossing them in the air akin to wedding bouquets. You best not get my hopes up answered Chester, laughing as insanely as he could muster. <laughs> he climbed over bodies uh, to reach the windows, and he beat on it with his metallic elbow. <clears throat> but thou, but thou, the echo went and reverberated through all of their manic, panicked brains as a clear measure of protest and dissent one of the chronics, Wheezy, threw his own feces at the security camera. How about that? <laughs> Aloysius saw this and begged the others to free his hands from their bandaged coffins. Wait, they weren't bandaged. Well, they were strapped down. They weren't bandaged. Okay, I should edit that. Except that he was unable to enunciate his wishes, only managing a... Take a fucking and to take it all over my hands. I need to beat my meat. What a terrible fate to be subjected to in an uncaring and unfor unforgiving realm of modernized, machinated madness. The floor it became hot. Those who had failed, those had who had failed to wear socks and little slippy shoes thrashed and danced about in a fruitless attempt to stay off the floor. Where is the fire department? Asked Ricky of Desmond. Oh, it's only a couple miles down the road. 
So, uh, we should be okay then, right? I hope so, brother. Otherwise, I don't even want to imagine. Well, best to get right to it then, because from my vantage point, it seems that we are fucked. I wouldn't be so hasty. This kind of thing sort of happens all the time. What? They, they always lock, they always lock all of these in here? Oh. oh yeah, absolutely. There's an open courtyard surrounded by barbed wire right down there. Why don't they take us down there where we wouldn't be, I don't know, suffocating to death on smoke? I asked them that, I asked them that one time. They said it was a security concern. Security concern? Get out of here! We're out there! Almost daily running around that same fucking courtyard in goddamn circles for exercise. There ain't no way anyone's getting over that goddamn fence. Well, that's what they told me. Well, you should have told them that they're a bunch of morons. Well, I did in so many words. And that was when the lights went out. The generator quickly took over. Red lights turned on above the fire exit signs. And wouldn't it have been nice if they had been led to a fire exit instead of locked inside? I do not want to die in a fire with you people, Ricky spoke. Well then, Ricky, toss out some ideas. How about that? We are getting younger in here. Chester the cheese dog had taken to ramming his head into the window pane. And that wasn't working either. So on the fly, he changed plans and he grabbed Aloysius's wheelchair and started ramming into the glass. Aloysius didn't put up a fight, though some of the patients did, in an attempt to stop the madness from ensuing. But all kinds of chaos was exploding here in the stairwell. And there was no one qualified to rein it in. Oh, what are you doing with that poor old man, said Greta. What's it look like I'm doing, answered Chester. I'm going to run this motherfucker straight through the window. And when he falls, I'm going to land right on his stinking ass corpse. Well, nobody told anybody, but... Aloysius, well, he had his ace in the hole. It was one of the few remaining components that, unbeknownst to all, was still functioning. Once his onboard system detected a life or death situation, his brain did a full restart. And as a consequence, his operating system went into danger mode. It happened so suddenly, without warning, the retro rockets engaged and the thrusters thus activated. Which means it's time to put the hat back on. They extended from the shoulder blades and from the flanks. Machinery clanked and shifted as baby blue stabilizer fins popped out of the bases of the thrusters. It all had a cool 1950s style. Aloysius, he had paid extra for that little bonus. Foom! Resounded the supersonic jet engines. The extreme heat concentrated in a very small spot. And that spot was exactly where Chester the Cheese Dog was standing. So the engines, they torched him. The patients reeled back from the abrupt display of rocketry. Still, Chester did not let go. And as a result, he was still holding on to Aloysius' wheelchair when he, they, <gasps> blasted out of the hospital. Though the cheese dog's grip did not hold for long, and so thus he plummeted. Flailing, cursing, spinning, and shrieking to the icy courtyard. The patients gathered at the windblown edge, their new way out as Aloysius flew off. Foo. 
into the distance, leaving a corkscrew trail of exhaust as he made his final lay out of the hospital. If only the patients had such a grand opportunity. Even so, right here not only gave them a way out, but it also gave them oxygen, which was excellent because people always need that, you know? That was great, but it also gave the fire itself a backdraft. So, not so great. Masterson returned with the white shirts. Finally, Milky Joe, who was strapped down to a gurney in the Doc X-12000 on a pallet jack. Order! Order, you animals! Commanded Masterson behind a fusillade of Thorazine darts. He and his cronies battled through, tasing and bludgeoning everyone in their paths. What is going on in here? Where is Aloysius and Chester? Many patients answered at once. Masterson understood none of it. They done flew the coop! They done flew the coop! Remarked Milky Joe, drugged, staring through the hole, blasted through the side of the building, up at the sky, up at the winding corkscrew trail. And in that moment, he wished that he too could be a bird or something quite similar. But things were not about to end so easily. After all, there was the fire which was growing faster in intensity than ever before, and there was the fact that there was an open exit to the outside world which was a problem because many of the patients herded into there were actively trying to hurl themselves out. It was up to folks who still had their whips about them, people like Ricky Desmond, Eunice, and Greta, to cordon off the opening at risk to their own lives. Because the white shirts sure weren't helping, but then again, that was totally their fucking style anyway. It's not worth it, shouted Ricky. He made a bold attempt to stare down the stampeding wall of clients, but their sheer number was of overwhelming consequence. Ricky planted both feet, holding out his arms, extending his love, extending his gratitude to life. He briefly gazed to his left and his right, looking deeply into the eyes of his compatriots, his newfound friends, these may be our final moments, declared Ricky, and I just wanted to know that, I just wanted you to know that I love you guys, all of you, I do. And if I die saving the lives of a few folks, well, that's better than killing myself, lighting my ass on fire with a hot pipe and can of gas. Oh, a hint of redemption? Desmond chuckled, reaffirming the unit E defense of the open portal of reality and death below. Now that I'm staring death in the face, five stories up, I recognize that maybe... And that was when the white shirts made the final advance. Patients did all that they could to break through either side of the line while Masterson and his crew tased and fired darts and bludgeoned and hawk-tied all in their path. In response, the patients pressed back towards the gaping hole in the wall, the gaping hole to freedom, the gaping hole to death. And the force of the human wave, it was beyond the scope of Unit E's abilities as human beings. Thence the final push came. It came at the behest of crackling tasers and folks covered from head to toe in darts until they became voodoo dolls with akathisia dressed in baby blue and mint green pajamas, flailing and scrambling over the edge. No! Ricky resounded as the human wave carried him out the blown apart window in a feat of unintentional crowd surfing. Ricky, as well as most of Unit E, defenestrated. The patience of Unit E fell, spiraling amidst the other lost and fearful souls. And everything went black. Weeks later, 
Ricky finally awoke from his coma. He was alone, head to toe in bandages in a hospital room. Something had happened. He was unable to move. Not only was he strapped down, but he was filled with tubes and wires coming out of every piece of his body that prevented any real movement. Eventually, Griselda arrived. She was pushing a dolly, and upon it was the Doc X-12000. Oh, good. You're awake, she uttered. Time for a psychological evaluation. What? exclaimed Ricky. Not, not, not again. Not now. It's okay, Ricky, said Griselda, smiling. She loosened his straps and freed his wrists. There's nothing to worry about. You're safe. Ricky furrowed his brow and sat up in bed. The incessant beeping of the heart and vital signs monitor cut through the silence of the awkward moment. Yes, Ricky, said Doc X 12,000. Everything is okay. Hospital status alert. Relegated to green level. Chances of death are minimal. Oh, minimal, said Griselda. Do you hear the sound of that? Wait a second, Ricky blurted. Nobody out there died, did they? Griselda's face became solemn. She bit down on her lower lip. I'm sorry to tell you this, but, um... But what? I'm sorry to say, but a lot of folks didn't make it. What? Then Doc X-12000 jumped in. Jumped in. It is sad to think of, but... You must move forward and not ruminate. Grieving is okay. There is nothing wrong with grieving. Sadness and loss is a facet of life as a human that must be coped with. If you wish to obtain a list of healthy coping skills, say affirmative. Ah, affirmative, said Ricky. Doc X 12,000 rapidly printed out several papers and shot them onto Ricky's bed to a slot in its chrome-plated torso. It was sad to say, began Griselda, but Chester didn't make it. Ricky glanced at her, expressionless. If there was one patient he suspected didn't make it, it was, uh, it was definitely Chester. I know he was a friend of yours, she said, eyes watering. Well, what about Desmond, Eunice, Greta? Oh, they're fine. I mean, I'm not really supposed to tell you, but uh, patient confidentiality, you know, but there were some broken bones. Greta had to have the plate in her head replaced. Desmond lost a pinky toe, but for the most part, they're all recovering very well. That's amazing, resounded Ricky. He rose up in his bed with a triumphant finger point extended to the heavens. Those pulled down when the wires and IV tubes went taut and the resulting resistance thus snapped them back down. Calm down, Ricky, spoke Griselda. You're going to split your stitches. Do you feel depressed? asked Doc X 12,000. Like you might feel you are better off not living or that you want to hurt yourself in some way? Are you kidding laughed Ricky. I've never been more grateful to be alive. Excellent. You must be very motivated if that is the case. We shall see about soon scheduling your discharge date. Ricky was well on the road to recovery. Thank you very much. That is a uh, story I began in 2014. Some, some moments that were inspired. I mean, as far as like the, the gas can thing, no, I never fought with any police officers over a box of matches, but uh, I mean, that, that situation, kind of situation is what landed me in the hospital that time. And, uh, and at one point during that stay, there was a, a, a fire somewhere and they all corralled us into a um, stairwell and locked the door and that's when I got the idea for the uh, how to end the story but then I didn't actually end the story until a couple weeks ago when I picked the story up because a lot of times I'll start writing a story and then I would be like oh 
oh, the, uh, I'm not in the same frame of mind or whatever, so I never, I don't go back to it. So there's a whole bunch of um, short stories and things that I never completed. And um, medication time, I'd spent enough time on it that I was like, come on, I got to fucking finish this thing. So I did. And this was the first time I ever read it out loud or, you know, uh, yeah, first time ever. So today is my 32nd birthday and um, celebrating it by um, working and going live because that's what I like doing and smoking weed. Can't forget about that. So what's next? I don't know. I'm going to go to Clinker Daggers tomorrow night with uh, my family, and that would be a nice uh, place to go. That's a place that when I first came to this town, um, and I had my neighbor Noah, and he was like, no, oh, man, I was, when he was working at Clinker Daggers. He was like, oh, George R. R. Martin, that guy, that the Game of Thrones guy came in to eat one time, and I was like, hey, he came in there. So, like, um, yeah, then I, I was like, I have to go there eventually. And I went there about a year or two ago, and... Uh, I guess about a year ago, and I liked it a lot. So I'm looking forward to that. Let's say hi to my mother, Virginia. Hi to Nick. Hi, Sophia Diaz, my love. Hi to the Pathfinder group, Lexi, Paul, James. Having a good time. And um, I'll say hi to all the poetry people. And uh, my father, hi. And uh, it'll be a good time. There's no party at my house this year, but there is. A, this is a party of a different kind. Yes, and I'm living my dream uh, as a poet. I know, uh, you know, I always wanted to do that. And although I'm not a rich man, I do. I'm doing what I want to do, and um, it's all coming together. And there's more events all the time. Like I found out yesterday that. Um, I don't have it written down here, but I'm going to be doing some, um, there's a few events that are going to be at the Spokane libraries, uh, around the area. There's like one at the, the Moran Prairie library and there's one at the like Spokane Valley library. There's a couple of different ones, although I may be wrong about the exact locations, but I'm going to be reading my, um, poem from, uh, Spokane Wright 75th anniversary anthology. And uh, people are welcome to come, and those events are on, will be on Facebook soon. And there's also, uh, I'll be reading at the Power to the Poetry event uh, on 220 at the, li which is also, it's, it's at the downtown Spokane Library. And uh, they're also having a slam competition at Auntie's Bookstore on 228. Um, that's at 7 p.m. to 8.30. On uh, one thirty one, I will be on the podcast uh, for the social hour at socialhourpod.com. And uh, you're going to get to hear or see, yeah, hear how I failed the Donald Trump's uh, cognitive presidential mental health test. But, you know, I am a uh, mental patient. Uh, well, not right now, but I've been a mental patient in the past. So, you know, the, the stuff that involves memorizing um, numbers and orders of things fail. Words, though? I'm good at memorizing words. I'm the word guy. I did. That's the only question I think I got right, <laughs> pretty much. And then um, on 2-4, there's going to be a workshop at Boots Bakery. Um, so you can work on poetry and stuff. And, uh, and then like an hour after that, uh, well, the sign-up start at 7 for the, uh, um, the poetry slam. And then the slam starts at 8. And then on 2-5 at the Bartlett, there's the Women of the World uh, Poetry Slam Qualifier, and that starts at 8 o'clock, and it's going to be the uh, special the women of Spokane uh, competing against each other to go to Dallas and determine the um, greatest woman poet of the world. Well, woman slam poet. So I'm going to rock that, or you're going to rock that. You're going to kick some ass. Spokane, kick some ass. And uh, Art Seed got shows on 2 9, 2 16, and 3 16. I will be at all of those reading poetry like a madman. Like a madman! I usually go uh, for like four hours. Well, it's from, they're usually from um, 5 to 9. So I get there and I, I uh, 
I only take about like one or two cigarette breaks, and it's like uh, well, only like ten minute breaks maybe, and I just go the whole way. I just keep going, poetry, poetry, story, poetry, everything, and uh, yeah, I'll probably be a live feed from that. And uh, I'm gonna get back to my birthday because it's my birthday, and uh, I'm gonna leave you with um, with that. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Manzoni in the morning, birthday edition.